Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. When my wife and I bought our first house together in the suburbs, we were thrilled. It was a quaint little two-story home with a big backyard, perfect for raising a family. And the neighborhood seemed idyllic too, with kids riding bikes down tree-lined streets and neighbors chatting over white picket fences. For the first few months, it was everything we had dreamed of. That is until Helen moved in down the street and became president of the Homeowners Association. The day after Helen was elected, fancy new signs went up all over declaring our sleepy community and Homeowners Association neighborhood. Helen wasted no time imposing her authority. Suddenly there were meetings to attend, fees to pay, and pages upon pages of new rules. Don't get me wrong, we were happy to do our part for the community, but Helen took things to the extreme. We first got a glimpse of her irrational zeal a few weeks later. My wife and I were redoing our stone driveway, which wraps around the side of the house, when Helen came marching over. Without even a hello, she announced, This is going to be the new Maple Road entrance. I chuckled uncertainly, assuming she must be joking. Sorry, what? This is our private driveway. Helen pursed her lips, looking impatient. Yes, I'm aware of that, but we need another access road into the neighborhood, and your driveway is the perfect location. I stared at her, dumbfounded. Was this woman serious? With all due respect, I replied, struggling to stay calm. This is my property. I'm not turning my driveway into a public street. Helen's nostrils flared angrily. As Homeowners Association President, I am authorized to make changes for the good of the whole community. You will comply. My wife tried to defuse the tension. I'm sure we can find a solution that works for everyone. But Helen cut her off. This matter is not up for discussion. I expect construction on Maple Road to begin immediately. And with that, she turned and marched off. My wife and I just shook our heads in disbelief. Who did this lady think she was? Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of Helen's crusade against us. Over the next few weeks, Helen became consumed with her vision for Maple Road. She had a huge gilded sign installed at the end of our driveway announcing the road name. She drew up elaborate plans to widen the pavement and install speed bumps. She even redirected traffic onto the new road against our wishes. Her coup de grace was posting a surveyor at the foot of our driveway to track traffic for city planning purposes. No matter how reasonably we objected, Helen refused to back down. This is homeowners association property now, she would declare smugly. All homeowners agreed to allow easements when they joined. No such agreement existed, of course. And Helen provided no compensation for commandeering our driveway. But she gleefully flaunted her self-appointed power at every turn. The final straw came early one Saturday when I opened my door to find a crew of construction workers ready to start jackhammering the driveway. Helen stood nearby, grinning victoriously. When I angrily confronted her, she dismissed my concerns as a necessary sacrifice for the community. Well, this mama bear had had enough. I ordered the crew to leave immediately before I called the police. Then I let Helen know in no uncertain terms that if she set foot on my property again, she would be arrested for trespassing. How dare you! She sputtered. I'll see you fined and evicted for this! I had to laugh. On what grounds? This is my land. You have zero authority here. For once, Helen had no snappy retort. She simply scowled and marched off, yelling vaguely about lawsuits and revenge. Unfortunately, Helen's thirst for retaliation was not easily quenched. Over the next few weeks, she slapped us with petty citations for the most minor infractions, bushes allegedly too tall, a mailbox painted the wrong color, etc. She even tried to have our cars towed from the end of our own driveway. Thankfully, I had had the foresight to install security cameras weeks earlier. We now had video evidence of Helen's outrageous behavior. When she realized I was documenting her harassment, she quickly backed off on the bogus citations. However, Helen then tried a new tactic, lobbying neighbors to shun us socially for being selfish rule-breaking rogues. Fortunately, once people heard our side of things, they were largely sympathetic. Helen's own power-hungry actions had turned many against her iron-fisted leadership. After two months of this nonsense, I'd had it. I consulted a lawyer who helped me take legal action against Helen for encroaching on our property rights and overstepping her authority as Homeowners Association president. When Helen was served papers announcing our lawsuit against her, she went ballistic. She singled us out at meetings, ranting about our rebellion, and insisting all homeowners help fund her legal defense. Of course, most people had tired of her antics by then. They refused to be bullied into bankrolling Helen's personal vendetta against us. 
Despite her best attempts to rally the community against us, the facts were hard to dispute. During the court case, we provided ample evidence that Helen had repeatedly and unlawfully tried to commandeer our driveway as public homeowners association property. Her only defense was that her actions were in the neighborhood's best interests, but she had not one document to back up this claim. In the end, the judge admonished Helen harshly for abusing her powers and neglecting due process. Not only were we awarded financial restitution, but Helen was forced to resign as Homeowners Association president immediately. She was also barred from running for a leadership position again. As Helen stormed out of the courtroom, escorted by a bailiff, the neighborhood erupted into cheers and applause. Justice had been served at last. In the months since the trial ended, the community has become a much happier place. Freed from Helen's tyrannical rule, people are relaxed and friendly again. As for my wife and me, we are thankful to have our driveway back with no more delusions of public grandeur. The only remnants of Helen's reign are the maple ard signs, which have become something of a neighborhood inside joke. We even sold t-shirts as a fundraiser with the slogan, Maple Ard is my private driveway. While Helen did end up moving away in disgrace, her legacy remains a cautionary tale. Power corrupts, and even neighborhood leaders need checks and balances. But if we stand up to bullies and defend our rights, sometimes the little guy really can prevail over the petty despots of suburbia. As for my family, we now happily wave to neighbors instead of homeowners association presidents as we back out of our driveway onto the open road. The next one is a pro-revenge story. I spent two years working for a particular boss who I'll call Dan. Dan was, and almost certainly still is, the most unacceptable human being I've ever had the displeasure of encountering. He was a compulsive liar, a narcissist, short-tempered, unethical, unreasonable, unintelligent, and abusive. I once witnessed him spend half an hour shouting at a salesman for wearing shoes that Dan didn't approve of. Not inappropriate shoes, mind you, but just ones that Dan didn't like. The salesman in question could have gone home and changed his shoes in the time that Dan spent cursing him out and belittling him. He also sold a client second-hand computer, claiming they were new and priced as new ones. This man not only assaulted me, but verbally and emotionally abused me for the better part of two years, and did everything in his power to keep me under his thumb. He constantly micromanaged me, to the point of just dictating to me what I should write in an email to a client. If it wasn't done exactly his way, it wasn't correct. I had to argue with him just to get a goddamn sick day, even though I'm legally entitled to it. I was woefully underpaid and on call 24 7 This made it difficult for me to find other employment and is one of the reasons I stayed as long as I did. He made my life absolutely miserable, and I developed a bit of a drinking problem as a result. I recently watched a presentation on domestic violence, and his behavior is a textbook case of what DV abusers do. I could go on and on about the things that this man did to be the biggest a hole he could be, but this is pro-revenge, not bad bosses, so I'll get to the story. One day Dan and I had a disagreement about something, I was right, and I had the emails to prove it, and I was frankly fed up with his bullshit. I told him I wouldn't be going to work because I was taking a sick day. He proceeded to shove me down to the ground. He's a big guy, probably one of the reasons he's gotten away with being the human garbage he is for so long, and starts trying to strangle me. I was able to fend him off and escape, and after I did, I filed a police report. There were no witnesses, so that was going to go nowhere. He actually had one of his other subordinates make a claim that the alleged assault didn't happen. Said subordinate wasn't there at the time, so false report. I naturally told everyone I knew, and all his clients that contacted me afterward, I was their primary IT support, so quite a few of them had my personal number, that I had filed a police report against him for assault. I specifically said it that way because unlike simply claiming that he assaulted me, telling people I filed a report was unarguably true and not slanderous. A lot of his clients were already not happy with the services he provided, internet and PBX, so that certainly turned a lot of them off of renewing their contracts. A very close family friend of mine, Carol, was naturally one of the first to hear about the assault. I left the country about a month later in search of better opportunities, but my friend remained and became the chairman of the board of trustees for the body corporate of the neighborhood where Dan lived. A body corporate is basically like an homeowner's association, but with different laws governing them. She set her sights on making his life hell. Dan had a broken down car that had been broken down for over a year at that point. He never had the money to fix it, because he's a crappy businessman who never seemed to realize that his business model had really tiny profit margins, and the rules of the neighborhood were changed to force broken down cars to be towed away. 
If the owner didn't tow it, the body corporate would, and charge the owner. And fine them. So Dan was fined a few times, not small amounts either, and when he was fined, he did what he always does when things don't go his way, throw a ducking tantrum while having no leg to stand on. The tantrum in this case was several expletive-filled emails to the body corporate, which is just such a great way to endear yourself to someone who already hates you, which got him fined again for breaking the conduct code. This, combined with the loss of revenue for his business, has led to him not having any substantial income for over half a year now. He has no car, nor the money to buy one, Several of his big clients are definitely not going to renew contracts with him, and he appears to no longer have any staff in his employ. Nobody's seen anyone coming to his house in months now, and the body corporate is pressuring his landlord to evict him. He's well and truly ducked. I'm living happily in another country now, and got an awesome job that pays 20 times what working for him did. Yes, really. 20 times more money. That's how little I made under him. The next one is a petty revenge story. This occurred at a large chain sporting goods store on Black Friday. Before the sale began, shoppers had been lining up in front of tables covered with cloth in order to get the doorbuster items underneath. The bell sounds and the cloth is lifted. I'm quickly, yet respectfully, rifling through a table of highly discounted yoga pants in various colors when I get shoved pretty aggressively from behind. I ignore it and continue what I'm doing. Another shove, this time a screechy voice calls out, Make some room or move your ass! Now keep in mind, the table is very large, so it's not like I was homeowners association ding prime real estate all for myself. Karen just wanted in and didn't care who she had to run over to get it. Rather than make a scene, I wedged against another shopper allowing her some room to slide closer. I had the last pair of size medium black pants on the table draped over my arm, looking through sizes of another color when I felt the pants gets pulled off my arm. I looked up and of course it's Karen, so I said, hey, those are mine and grab onto them, to which she replies with an obnoxious smirk, not until you pay for them, and started pulling them, trying to get them out of my hands. At this point I know it's only going to go downhill, so rather than be on the 6 o'clock news for fighting on Black Friday, I cut my losses and decided to leave the table. My husband, who had been watching from a spot about 20 feet away, was half laughing as he saw me retreat empty-handed and defeated. Cheer up, he said, and pushed a shopping cart toward me filled nearly to the top, here you go. Wouldn't you know, my amazing husband had commandeered the pushy woman's cart while she was busy digging through yoga pants. We smiled at each other and I happily rolled her cart and all her other Black Friday finds to the other end of the store, then turned her purse into customer service on my way out of the door. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I am a secretary for a medical facility that funds other medical institutions. I am also responsible for their travel to conventions and conferences. The is a very large, very highly attended conference held each year in which our medical professional staff are invited as presenters. One such Karen-esque presenter just has to be incredibly difficult as she feels she is above us dregs and never lets us forget it. As a presenter, they are given certain hotels that are reserved for them at a reduced rate. However, most are nowhere near the convention site, and they end up paying a crap load of money to cabs. No Uber at the time. I set up the travel for at least 10 folk when I realized that by a loophole I can book them into the hotel where the conference is held. So I do that instead of allowing the conf. Coordinators to book them in heaven know where at the last minute, which they are prone to do. Karen come up to me and demands that I only book her into the hotel's listed BT, the conference coordinators, and if I don't, she will have me written up. So that's what I did. The day before they all leave for the conference, which was clean across the country on the west coast, Karen found out she was not only the only one not booked in the conference hotel, but she was nine miles away near the airport, and no, there were no more rooms available at Conf Hotel. She was hopping mad and stormed to my desk, screaming about my putting her in a faraway two-star hotel. I looked at her and calmly stated that she was in one of the three hotels the Conf. Coordinators reserved for her, and she distinctly instructed me to only select those hotels and nothing else. She ended up spending more than $70 in cab fare to and from the hotel to the venue while everyone else only had to go downstairs from their hotel rooms. She almost missed giving her presentation because she was late. After that, when I booked everyone for a trip, Karen no longer demanded I give her special treatment and lets me use my judgment when booking hotels. The next one is an entitled people story. This was at the beginning of the pandemic just before countries were beginning their lockdowns. The wife and I were visiting our families in our country of birth and had to rush back to our home country. 
The airline had canceled our pre-booked flights and rerouted us via three other flights across various countries. This also meant that the seats we'd booked wouldn't be the ones we'd be getting. To say it was a nightmare of a journey wouldn't be an exaggeration. While the first flight was barely three hours, the second flight was nine hours of being wedged between people in the center row after a ten-hour layover. With just another fifteen hours until we reached home, five-hour layover plus the final ten-hour flight, we tried our best to just suck it up in spite of not having slept for over a day. I'm our luck turned for the better on the final flight as we were assigned a window and middle seat. Seating configuration was 343. Upon boarding, we realized that the aisle seat beside mine was unoccupied. Overjoyed, I took the aisle seat while my wife took the window seat. We were barely able to keep our eyes open at this point and were looking forward to getting some sleep at last. All was going well until a mom boarded with two kids, M11, F7, in tow. We'd seen them at the airport and could tell this was their only flight, or at least their first. They were assigned the middle row of four seats between the three of them, just a few rows ahead of us. While putting their bags into the overhead bins, the mom was scanning the other seats and spotted the empty one between my wife and I. There was no way in hell either my wife or I were going to be seated next to some other person's child. Once the doors were closed and we were waiting to start taxi stage, her son starts loudly whining about wanting a window seat. In no time, the little brat starts crying and demanding a window seat. The passengers around them were clearly annoyed at listening to a freaking 11-year-old throw a tantrum, but were way too decent to say anything. Instead of telling her child to STFU, the mother encourages the son to go ask passengers if they'd be willing to give up their seat while turning around and looking at my wife and me. I woke my wife up to inform her of what to expect and told her to stand her ground if the lady asked. When the flight crew came by to check our seatbelts, they saw the woman standing up and told her to sit down and buckle up. We noticed her trying to say something to the attendant but could hear what was being said. Once up in the air and the seatbelt signs we turned off, the mother once again stands up to look in our direction, but I made sure not to make any eye contact. By then the kid had settled into his seat but the mother was adamant on looking for some sucker to give up their window seat. Her plan was to get the son to sit somewhere else while she and her daughter could lay down comfortably across the four seats. Since that didn't work, she chose to keep glaring at me every time she got up to go to the toilet. At one point, I smiled at her and got an even worse stare. Note to parents traveling with young kids. We get that traveling with kids isn't easy, but that doesn't mean you're entitled to have other people sacrifice their comfort to make your life easier. We all reap what we sow. The next one is an entitled parent story. For reference, I'm 17 and am in school full-time five days a week. I work 12, 8 on the weekends and haven't had a day off other than for COVID leave since August. Of course, my seven-day week schedule isn't ideal, but I really appreciate the income and have grown to like my job. Last summer, I really struggled to find myself a job. I was 16, and after dropping in and emailing 40 different employers and revising my CV about a million times, I lost all hope. My parents decided that I was old enough to support myself and cut me off financially and stopped giving me bus money or lifts. I live in the countryside, about 20 km away from all my friends, so I spent the summer completely alone, which was really difficult for me. All of my employed friends had gotten their jobs through their parents or friends of their parents, but my parents still made no effort to put in a personal word on my behalf to any employers they were on friendly terms with. Anyways, August rolled around and I finally got a job at a McDonald's about a half hour drive from me after four months in isolation. My parents immediately turned their noses up at the mention of McDonald's, but I wasn't in any position to be picky, and I'm still very grateful for the job. They have always put massive pressure on me to do well in school, and so, to please them, I've been overexerting myself for months and have a long streak of A's and B's. Unfortunately, I miss a day or two of school on average a month because of my period. For years, I've spent once a month paralyzed with cramps and nausea, which are a million times worse than what any other girl I've talked to about this has ever experienced. I'm convinced I have endometriosis and have brought the subject up with my parents again and again over the years and have begged them for a hospital appointment. Four years later, and I still haven't seen anybody about my period pains and I still continue to miss school over it. Despite this, my parents are constantly on my back about the days that I've missed at school and yet neglect to get me any sort of help or treatment for what I'm going through. About two months ago, I missed a week of school because I was sure I had COVID when in actuality I just had a bad dose of tonsillitis. My parents were furious when I tested negative for COVID and nagged and argued with me about it for about another month until I actually did test positive and ended up missing another full week of school. I have since caught up on all the work I missed and I haven't broken my streak of A's and B's. 
Today and yesterday, I stayed home from school because I've had another bout of tonsillitis, which went untreated last time and this time as well. Apparently, this was the breaking point for my dad, and he called me down from my room and told me if I didn't either quit my job or drop down to one day a week, he was going to go into my manager's office and withdraw his parental consent himself. He blamed my illness on work and told me that it was unacceptable that I was missing school and told me that I needed to take a day off to dedicate wholly to study. I tried to reason with him and showed him my report cards and recent test results and told him my grades were perfect and that I couldn't be blamed for catching COVID or tonsillitis. He shut me down and told me that my grades didn't matter because the fact remained that I was still missing school. I'm unsure what to do or how to change my dad's mind. I know a seven-day week is extreme for someone my age, but I have no other option. In order to see my friends and do nice things in the city outside of school, I need funds. In order to have funds, I need a job. My parents want me to have both a school life and a social life, but won't give me a single cent out of their pocket to get me out of my countryside jail cell. Pocket money is out of the question. I've tried to negotiate my way into making some kind of deal with them by doing good in school and doing any chores my parents ask of me, but their argument is that I shouldn't be rewarded for doing the bare minimum of what is expected of me. Now that I have my own job, I'm financially independent and can no longer be guilt-tripped by them about money or by my laziness. I am currently saving for a month-long holiday during the summer and I already have deposits laid down and plane tickets bought. Still, I need to earn a little extra money to pay the entire thing off. It's my reward to myself for the effort I've put in at school and for all the hours I've worked. I really want to do something nice for myself before I hunker down and inevitably quit my job for my final year at school next year. For me, my job allows me to actually do nice things for myself and to see my friends. Quitting it or slicing my income in half is not an option. Without it, my parents have made it very clear that they would not support me or give me any kind of pocket money to get a bus to see my friends or to treat myself. I've proved to my parents time and time again that I can excel in school, take care of my physical and mental health, see my friends and simultaneously work, but they're still not satisfied. I'm very frustrated by this whole situation as I am an only child who is fortunate to have two working parents who are married happily. Still, it often bothers me that I have friends with five siblings and a single mother who have better financial support than me. Of course, I know people's financial situations are not nearly as straightforward as that, and I don't mean to sound spoiled, but it is frustrating for me, and I wish my life could be different. What can I do? Am I being in a hole by not obeying them? Is this fair? <laughs> Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.